Self-controlled Chinese rocket core is falling to Earth, but experts are unsure about when or where it will land. The object is a 21-tonne leftover from China's Long March 5B rocket, which carried a piece of its new Tian space station into orbit late last month. Joining us live is Brad Tucker, the ANU cosmologist and astrophysicist. Brad, appreciate your time. Reports are suggesting yeah. that this space junk is out of control and heading for Earth. Should we be worried? Yeah, I mean, it, uncontrolled and heading for us is never words you obviously want to piece together, but uh, this is the reality of the situation. Uh, once you lose control of a piece of debris, th that's pretty much it. You can't really solve it. And in this case, because it was a rocket booster, there actually never was control once it was put into orbit. Uh, and so the issue we really have is we have an uncontrolled piece of debris, and because the atmosphere really does change, it's actually hard to predict where on Earth it's going to hit, and therefore when. So there's a lot of uncertainty about when this thing will come down. So we do know it'll come down, and most likely it will happen over an uninhabited piece of Earth. But we do know that it'll land anywhere between plus 42 and minus 42 latitude, which is from like Copenhagen to south of Tasmania, which is you know pretty much the whole world. So it could be dangerous if it hits the wrong spot and also could be expensive. I mean, who actually gets the bill if there is a big mess to clean up? Is it China? So, you know, this is quite interesting because there's a very famous case in 79 when Skylab, the U.S. space station, crashed over Esperance in WA. Uh, and again, that was kind of the very first big piece of space junk that came down. That weighed about 71 or 77 tons. And as you said, it was about just over 20 tons for the this rocket booster. So it was a lot bigger and it did land in WA uh, and it didn't hit anyone, but it did land near somewhat populated areas. Now, ultimately, it was actually Australia who just had to deal with it. Now, there's actually a lot of people who picked up pieces of debris. And in fact, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle actually paid someone $10,000 for the first person who actually gave them a piece of debris. Uh, actually, what eventually happened is Esperance issued a littering fine uh, to NASA. Um, it was only like 400 bucks, which they never paid for. So in this case, even if the Chinese do land in an inhabited area or a country, Ultimately, the country that it lands in will have to deal with it. Brad, do we know how much space junk is actually up in space and how much will actually ever make it back to Earth? I mean, most of it's up there for good now, right? There, there's quite a bit that is going to be up there for hundreds of years, but there's also stuff that's coming down almost every day. Now, some of this ranges from the size of a flake of paint to, in this case, an entire 20-ton rocket booster. Uh, now, ultimately, a lot of it does come back down. Uh, there's currently about 300,000 pieces bigger than 15 centimetres. Now, 15 centimetres is important because this can be tracked by U.S. Air Force radar, so we at least know where it is. Because the, the real issue we have is not only do you have the junk, but when it crashes into things, it breaks apart, which creates more things, which breaks it apart and creates more things. It's this triggering or cascading effect. And we think there could be upwards of one or two million pieces of smaller bits of debris, you know, sides of screws, Bits, bits of paint, all actually which pose a danger because these are traveling 40,000 kilometers an hour in some cases. So even if it's the screw, size of a screw, being hit at 40,000 kilometers an hour is not a good thing. No, and what if something like that collided with a satellite, for example? I mean, that could be a real risk, couldn't it? Is there any way of avoiding that? Yeah, look, I mean, essentially it could be the end of that satellite in wood. And a great example is, um, you know, there was essentially glass on the space shuttle that had a flake of paint that created a hole five centimeters deep and essentially bulletproof glass, literally a piece of paint. And, you know, space junk is actually something Australia is now playing a leading role of. We talk a lot about what Australia is doing in the space race, and that is using our land and therefore our eyes in the skies, what we call space situational awareness, space air traffic control. So that's not only tracking the known things, but the uncontrolled or unknown things here. So one of the projects we have at Mount Stromlo, so where we're based here in Canberra, is that we actually have a laser system that can track an object a couple centimeters wide, thousands of kilometers above the Earth, and now start to deorbit it. And Australia is literally the only country doing this and now leading the world. So we're gonna see Australia playing a bigger, bigger part in this space traffic control, because even though we may not be able to deorbit or get rid of the debris, you can at least tell the other stuff to get out of the way, again, to avoid that collision, which is the number one goal. The ultimate goal is to prevent junk, just like prevent pollution here on Earth. Um, but in this case, with this long 5B uh, rocket, that is no longer an option.
Yeah, it's hard enough to figure out the pollution problem on Earth, let alone in space. Brad, China's Long March 5B rocket that we mentioned, it was sent up to launch China's first module for its proposed space station. Where is China in the space race compared with, for example, the US and Russia? Just how advanced is China when it comes to its space ambitions? Yeah, look, they're really trying to be equal in terms of the US and Russia. You know, the US and Russia had a head start in terms of a lot of this, having that space race back in the late 50s into the 60s and 70s. And so what China's showing is that they can be equal partners and they can be equal footing to the US and Russia. And this is exactly one of the reasons why they've launched and are building their own space station. The US built Skylab, Russia built Mir, and now they have the International Space Station. Well, A, China is locked out of the International Space Station because of the U.S., but they also want to show that they can be and do just what the U.S. and Russia does. And part of that is showing we can build and operate our own space station. This is their goals on the moon. And later this month, we'll see China having their first rover doing the first potential touchdown on the surface of Mars. And again, this is something that Russia did and the U.S. did back in the 60s. And obviously, the U.S. is doing a lot of now and Russia with European partners. So, you know, China is trying to get to par with what the U.S. and Russia has done in the past, but also now keeping up with what they're doing now. So this is activity on the moon. This is looking upwards in space. So, you know, that they are what the U.S. and Russia did in the 60s, and that is they have a lot of people and a lot of money being thrown at the problem to solve it. Brad Tucker, always so interesting to tap your brain. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Take care.